Hell's Point, Part 14, Camera Work. The town didn't seem like much to me at first, but Erica was ecstatic and started filming almost immediately when we got there. It was largely deserted, so there wasn't really too many people to talk to. The only strange thing that I found was that the town seemed to be covered in an almost perpetual haze, as if you were looking through a dirty mirror. It almost reminded me of Brookhaven, but with a twist I couldn't quite put my finger on. Toby was pretty much the same as he ever was, constantly drawing in his notebook or looking out the window of our rented van. He seemed lost in thought most of the time. I guess we all were just trying to come to our own conclusions about what was going on in this town. I drove the van so Erica could shoot. It was a good day for it when we came into town. She said the day wasn't what she was looking for, that it was the night time when things would get weird. I wasn't sure how much I bought into the whole Hell's Point shtick, but at least I was doing something besides not being able to play football. As we pulled into the hotel parking lot, I hopped out of the van, closing the door behind me with a loud slam. It was dead quiet, and the streets looked like they were empty. I turned back to the van and pulled out our camera equipment. One camera per person, one laptop, and a ton of tapes and CDs to record just about as much of this town as we could stand. Come on, you guys. Let's get this party started, I said laughing as I slammed the sliding door and turned to face the hotel. It was gigantic. Like an old Victorian character estate, every window was stained glass, and the main entrance was two oaken double doors. Erica leapt up the steps in front of us and pulled on them. Locked, she said. Maybe they don't have any visitors, Toby said with a chuckle. That's crazy, she said, knocking loudly on the doors with her fist. Hello? Is there anybody in there? She called. Toby and I looked at each other, then back at Erica. Maybe there's just no one there, I called up to her. We can find a different place to stay in town. Well, that's disappointing, she said, crossing her arms and pouting. I would have loved to stay here. Just as we all turned to leave, the big oak doors swung wide and opened to reveal a tall, pale man in a black suit. He towered over all of us, even me, and I wasn't short. He must have stood about six foot five and looked down at us with a mixture of curiosity and amusement. And how may I help you, lady and gentleman? He asked, almost purring as he said it. Erica... Clearly frightened of the man, looked up into his dark eyes, and in a small voice she said, Um, I was just wondering if you had any rooms available. Something with a view, perhaps? He hissed softly in reply. Wordlessly she nodded. He clapped his hands in a businesslike manner. Very good. And how long will you be staying? Um, three weeks, replied Erica who might have been two feet tall compared to this man. Walking in behind him, we saw that the main hall was lined with masks of every shape and size. Some had horns or teeth, some had no eyes, or with mouths that were warped into grotesque screaming voids. At the end of the hallway, a large plaque with a strange symbol hung on the wall. It was long and flowing almost like a cross that had begun to splinter at its points or had been burned and had started to curl. Doby was fascinated with it and couldn't seem to take his eyes off of it. The thin man saw what Toby was looking at and smiled. It is the symbol of my benefactor, the two-headed dragon. These masks are his as well. He loves them all and has graciously agreed to distribute them all around the hotel to spread his art. Now, how will you be paying? Wordlessly, Erica handed him a check, which he put in a drawer at the front desk. Very good. Now the two of you shall sleep in room 7A, he said, motioning towards me and Toby. And the lady will be in the room across the hall, 7M. Handing each of us our keys, he smiled. Don't worry about your things. I'll bring them up to your rooms momentarily. 
There is a shower in each room, and checkout time is 10 a.m. Your rooms, he said, gesturing up a flight of stairs, are just up there. Have a pleasant stay. Without another word, we hurried up the steps and ran into Erica's room, breathing a sigh of relief. Erica looked pale and frightened. I thought he'd never finish, she said with a gasp. He's so pale. He looks like an old vampire. I laughed. Maybe that's what's wrong with this town. Vampires. Toby joined in, holding his hands up to his face, using his fingers to mimic teeth. Come here, Erica. I want to suck your blood. Bleh, he said, taunting her in a cheesy Transylvanian accent. Pushing Toby away, she started to pout again. Oh, be quiet, she said in exasperation. Toby and I laughed but soon fell silent. As the three of us looked out over the town of Shell Bay, we wondered if there really was anything to the stories Erica told us. Or maybe it was all just a hoax to lure in tourists. But if that was the case, then where were the tourists? We ended up staying in that night, just to sort of get a feel for our rooms and everything. We watched scary movies like Dracula and The Thing from the Black Lagoon. Things we came to affectionately refer to as nightmare fuel. It was about one o'clock in the morning before me and Toby said goodnight to Erica. We would have a busy few weeks ahead of us. And hey, I thought to myself, maybe if this whole thing goes through all right, we might even win an award or something. I had no idea what we were in for.